R3, R5, R7, R6, R6 Mark II, R10. Canon has definitely done an amazing job of lining up a very capable set of mirrorless cameras over the last few years. But finding the right camera for you that sits within your budget and delivers to what you needed to do in the field isn't always an easy task. So let me help you with this video to navigate the gear jungle and show you which cameras have performed the best for me in the field and what are some of the downsides that I found with each body. So by the end of this video, I'm hopeful that you will be able to make an informed decision and find the right camera for you. Let me start off by saying that the best and most expensive camera like this R3 isn't necessarily the right choice for everyone. It's an amazing camera and definitely looks very tempting at first glance. But at the same time, what is the right camera for you will largely depend on your budget and also what you want to do with the camera. So while an R3 is amazing, it will definitely give you fantastic photos and videos, you might be overpaying because there could very well be a cheaper camera available that actually does better what you wanted to do. Canon's lineup starts with a few very basic cameras that are mainly aimed at vloggers and content creators and that definitely fall short when it comes to series photography because they have a few shortcomings like very low frames per second and very small buffers. So for any sort of action photography, they wouldn't be suited and most people will definitely use them for some lighter video work or some easy content creation. The first camera in that lineup would be the R100. Very simple body, very small, very lightweight, has no IBIS, one SD card slot and comes with a 24 megapixel APS-C crop sensor. Interestingly, this camera also comes with no mechanical shutter and it only shoots at six frames per second. And if you shoot raw, the buffer is also only six frames. When it comes to video work, the camera offers decent capabilities. So nothing crazy to write home about, but at the same time, we can't forget that this camera only comes in at around $400. So it's a super small, super lightweight camera that's definitely aimed at people that want to upgrade from a smartphone, for instance, to be able to use different lenses to get a more cinematic look, but at the same time looking for camera that doesn't break the bank. For any serious photography, especially nature and wildlife photography, I wouldn't think that this camera is very well suited, even though it does have the eye tracking. The next camera in the lineup is the R50, another very small camera body also aimed at content creators that comes in with 24 megapixel APS-C sensor at least the R50 comes with a fully articulating screen, which is obviously very helpful for content creation, something the R100 strangely doesn't have. The R50 also doesn't come with IBIS and only has one SD card slot. Just like on the R100, Canon also left out the mechanical shutter on the R50, which means you only have the electronic shutter available and that one shoots in up to 15 frames per second. The only problem is that if you shoot raw, then your buffer is only seven files, which means you can shoot less than half a second before hitting the buffer, which is definitely a problem. The R50 also comes with Canon's great eye tracking autofocus. So if you love a small camera body that's still quite capable, then the R50 could definitely be an interesting choice, especially if you do a lot of vlogging and video work. Because the R50 can shoot in 4K 30 frames per second and then up to 120 frames per second in full HD. So it's quite capable in that regard. For serious bird or nature photography, I probably wouldn't go with that body, also because of the limitations, like no joystick and no wheel on the back of the camera. But overall, especially as a slightly higher up content creator camera, I think it's a very appealing camera. There's also the EOS R and the EOS RP, the first mirrorless full frame cameras that Canon released. Comes in at a very attractive price point. You could probably pick one up used very cheaply. But unless you're on a really tight budget, I probably wouldn't recommend these cameras anymore because they lack vital features like the eye tracking autofocus for instance, they have a crop and video format and they're also quite slow overall. Now with the first few cameras out of the way that were mainly aimed at content creators, we're slowly but surely getting to the cameras that I would consider a little bit more capable for serious photography. You will notice me talking about the buffer in this video a fair bit because that's definitely a major bottleneck with a lot of the lower end and even some of the higher end Canon bodies. They shoot all at relatively high frames per second, but then often have quite small buffers. And whenever you hit a buffer, it takes a little while before you can take another photo again. So it's definitely an area of concern for me, especially if you want to do some action photography. This is where all these cameras can definitely be a bit challenging because you hit that shutter button and then you hit the buffer very quickly. The next camera is the EOS R10. It's sort of the small cousin of the R7, and it also comes with a 24 megapixel APS-C crop sensor. 
For me, this would sort of be a quite small bodied entry level wildlife camera coming in at just under one pound or 400 grams and costing around that $900 mark. The R10 also doesn't have IBIS in body image stabilization, which hurts it a little bit when it comes to handheld video and low shutter speed photography. It is equipped with one SD card slot and it takes a smaller LPE 17 batteries that you can also find in the R100, R8 and R50. Unlike the other cameras we talked about so far, the R10 actually has a mechanical shutter and it shoots at 15 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and 23 frames per second with the electronic shutter. However, the buffer is under 30 RAW files again, so you will hit that buffer very quickly, especially when you're shooting in an electronic shutter mode. What a lot of you guys will obviously like as well that the camera has the great Canon eye tracking and it also has the pre-shooting ability. So in the menu, you can set up that the camera will capture photos already when you half press the shutter button, so it's much harder to miss the moment. What's great to see on the R10 that it has a joystick on the back of the camera, which makes it much easier to move things around in your menu or your autofocusing points, for instance, but it doesn't have a third wheel on the back of the camera. It just has the D-pad at the bottom. When it comes to video, the R10 is also quite capable delivering us 4K 30 uncropped and 4K up to 60 frames per second with a slight crop. Personally, I haven't used the R10 in the field a lot because I find the body just a little bit too small for my hands and the buttons on the camera are also tiny. So the navigation on the camera and the ergonomics weren't really to my liking. But if you love a small camera, then the R10 can definitely deliver you some fantastic images and videos in the field. And if you actually combine it with a lens like the IF100 to 400 millimeter lens, you get a very capable combo that weighs Almost nothing gives you up to 600 millimeters or over 600 millimeters effective focal length, and it also doesn't break your budget. So if you're looking for a capable, quite small size wildlife camera that you can combine with some of the cheaper wildlife Canon lenses to get a super lightweight yet capable combo, I think the R10 can definitely be an interesting choice for you. If you're shooting in RAW, then the buffer definitely can become an issue with a lot of these Canon cameras. And one way to circumvent this is to shoot in C RAW instead of RAW. This basically compresses your RAW files to make the small file size smaller, but at the same time, the image quality is still essentially the same. But what it allows you to do because you have the smaller files is to get much more frames in your buffer and thus in return allow you to shoot a little bit longer before hitting that buffer. And especially if you're shooting action, this can be quite helpful. And no matter what camera you're using, the best way to improve your images is actually to learn better image editing. And I would love to help you with that with my pro sets and my masterclass. It will not only increase your confidence when it comes to the image editing, but it will also help you to get the best results. With my pro sets, I allow you with just one click to get amazing results. And in my masterclass, I teach you step by step everything you need to know in Photoshop to make your images look truly amazing. So if that's of interest to you, make sure to check this out down there in the description. The next camera, the R7, is quite an interesting body. When it came out, many people were hoping that it would be like the mirrorless equivalent of the 7D. It didn't quite turn out that way because the body is quite different compared to 7D or like an R5, for instance. But all in all, the R7 is a very capable camera that can deliver you some amazing images in the field and gives you fantastic reach with a 32 megapixel APS-C crop sensor. And this is also the first camera in our lineup that comes with two SD card slots. The R7 also has IBIS in-body image stabilization and comes in at just 530 grams or around 1.2 pounds and costs about 1500 US dollars. The R7 can shoot up to 15 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and up to 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter, which is pretty crazy. But this is where some of the issues start because the camera has quite a strong shutter shock with the mechanical shutter. So at lower shutter speeds, a lot of the images show noticeable shutter shake, which is not ideal. So in most cases with the R7, I would recommend to use use the electronic first curtain shutter. That's kind of the best compromise of both worlds. You can shoot at 15 frames per second and you don't really get much of that shutter shock or much of the rolling shutter that you're actually getting when you're using the electronic shutter with the R7. It gets to the point that a lot of the images are very distorted and kind of wobbly, which is not ideal. So the electronic first curtain shutter seems to be the best compromise with the R7 in many cases. One thing Canon has kind of unofficially stated to a few people is that if you actually lower the frames per second on the R7 and use the electronic first curtain shutter, that the autofocus will be a little bit more accurate than if you shoot, for instance, in the electronic shutter mode and at 30 frames per second. So if you don't need the high speed, there definitely seems to be an advantage of throttling the frames per second on the R7 a little bit to get more accurate results. And if you want to know exactly how I set up my R7, I made a setup video about it and I've also linked a PDF setup guide for you down there in the description. 
The R7 also has excellent eye tracking, animal eye tracking in photo and video mode, similar to what you can find in the R3, yet it doesn't work quite as reliable as in the higher end bodies. It does work well, it finds the subject well, it checks it well, it just only has a tendency from time to time to slightly jump on and off your subject. So in a burst of images, there will always be some that are sort of unexplainably out of focus. Another little bottleneck with the R7 is the buffer again. It shoots at 15 or 30 frames per second, which is a lot for sure, but the buffer is only around 50 frames, I think. So you would definitely want to use C-RAW to increase the buffer to a few more frames, allowing you to shoot a little bit longer because if you shoot at 30 frames per second and your buffer is like 50 shots, that's just a little bit over one second of shooting before you hit that buffer. So that's definitely not ideal. Now, I don't want it to sound too negative though, because the R7 overall is a fantastic camera. It takes a little bit of getting used to, to the body with like the wheel on the back of the camera sitting up here, for instance, rather than down where your thumb normally is. I wish instead of the D-pad at the bottom of the camera would actually have a third wheel, which would make it easier to shoot full manual mode. But at the same time, it's still quite capable and quite nice. What's a little bit strange about this body is that even though it's so small that there's no battery grip or grip extension available. What many of you guys will love as well that the R7 was the first camera from Canon's lineup to offer pre-shooting as well. So you can select raw burst mode and then enable pre-shooting and that means whenever you half press the shutter button the camera will start recording at 30 frames per second before you actually press the shutter button. So if you just missed the moment, it's very likely that you actually already still captured it with the pre-shooting enabled. So that's a fantastic feature. Even though the implementation is a little bit clumsy because the camera just creates one large file and then you have to go through that file in either the Canon software or on the back of the camera and pick whichever raw file you want to extract from that. So I would prefer that you just have all the files on your camera card, but at the same time, this is still definitely very workable. When it comes to video, the R7 is also quite capable, allowing us to shoot in log and also shooting up to 4K 60 frames per second and full HD up to 120 frames per second. So definitely quite capable when it comes to the video. All in all, the R7 is a great little camera with fantastic reach. And for us, bird and wildlife photographers especially, reach often trumps a lot of other factors like slightly better performance or having a full frame sensor. Because for instance, with a lot of the other cameras that have like a 24 megapixel full frame sensor, for instance, you can be quite limited in your ability to crop. Whereas with a 32 megapixel APS-C crop sensor, you get a lot of pixels on your bird and when you take a raw file, you also have the ability to crop because you have the 32 megapixels. So you definitely have a good advantage there with the R7. So I think for a lot of wildlife enthusiasts, the R7 is a fantastic choice because you can have a small lens with it, like 100 to 400 or like an f11.6 or 800 millimeter lens and get some crazy reach in the field. And that's what we want many times, isn't it? The R7 is not my main camera, but whenever I use it, I'm positively surprised about the great reach and I usually come away with some nice images. So far, all cameras we've looked at were APS-C crop cameras, but now we're getting into an area where we also get some nice full frame cameras. Full frame camera usually gives you better image quality and comes with a few other advantages, but at the same time, a crop camera gives us that extra reach and a little bit more pixels on our subject. And that can matter quite a bit in the field, especially if you're photographing like small little shy birds, for instance. There isn't really one that's better or worse than the other, I would say, ultimately. It's more what you want to do. The full frame cameras are usually the better all round cameras, but if you're more dedicated into photographing wildlife and you need that extra bit of reach, especially with some small and lighter lenses, a crop camera like the A7 might actually have an advantage to you. The next camera in the lineup is the Canon R8. And I must say, this is quite a surprising little camera because you get a lot of bang for your buck. Canon basically didn't really hold back with this camera and put a lot of features from the much more expensive Canon R6 Mark II into this body. The main drawbacks for me with the R8 is that Canon left out the IBIS, the second card slot and the joystick on the back of the camera. Additionally to that, Canon also left out the mechanical shutter on the R8, meaning that you only have the electronic shutter or the electronic first curtain shutter available. With the electronic shutter, you can shoot up to an amazing 40 frames per second. And with the first curtain electronic shutter, you can shoot up to six frames per second. You might be sick about hearing about the buffer by now, but with the A, the buffer is also an issue again with only 56 raw files available when you shoot at 40 frames per second, which is definitely not a lot. So I'd probably go to zero if you're using the electronic shutter. However, 
If you're using the electronic first curtain shutter at just six frames per second, you can basically shoot unlimited. So if you don't need the high speed and don't shoot super fast action, you can definitely work with the buffer on that camera. When it comes to image quality and noise performance, the R8 delivers in the field having the same 24 megapixel full frame sensor that also the R6 Mark II has. In terms of the EVF and the rear screen, the R8 has the same EVF and rear screen resolution that the R7 has as well. With a weight of just under one pound or about 400 grams, the R8 is definitely another small body camera. However, unlike the R7 where you can't have any grip extension, the R8 also doesn't have a battery grip, but you can order a little extra grip extension to it that makes the camera a little bit easier to hold, even though it still doesn't help you much with the vertical shooting. One of the biggest downsides potentially with the R8 is that it has the smaller LPE17 batteries rather than having the batteries that the R7, the R6 and the R5 series have. So if you're looking at that R8 as a second body to an R7 for instance, you'll have two different types of batteries which is a little bit annoying. Not a deal breaker but it would be nice if it had the same batteries as the R7 for instance because I think a combination of like an R7 and an R8 could be a fantastic one-two punch for many photographers. When it comes to video, the R8 is also very capable, allowing us to shoot in 4K up to 60 frames per second and also shoot 120 frames per second in full HD. I think this is an area where the R8 definitely shines and would be an ideal second camera to film yourself in the field, for instance, or to make YouTube videos like this. For me, the R8 is the perfect budget conscious all-rounder for anyone who looks for a relatively small sized camera that doesn't break the bank, yet packs a punch. It has a lot of the features from the higher spec body, even though it doesn't have all of them, but it has enough of them that they can actually deliver you fantastic photos and videos in the field. The next camera in the lineup is the R6 Mark II, and I must say that this camera surprised and shocked me in a positive way. It has a fantastic image quality with a 24 megapixel full frame sensor, the same we can find in the R8 as well. It also has probably Canon's most advanced and most reliable autofocusing system, and it shoots up to 40 frames per second. So if 24 megapixels on a full frame camera is enough for you, more on that later, I think this camera is almost a no brainer. It can basically do anything you want it to do, and it comes in at just 2400 US dollars, which for what it delivers, I think is a fantastic price. The body has very nice ergonomics with all the wheels and joysticks in the right places, so it feels very nicely in your hand, and it's also not too heavy. It weighs in at about 588 grams, or around 1.3 pounds, and it was just a nice side to hold in your hand. And if you feel like the camera is too small or you want to do better vertical shooting, you can also get a nice full-size battery grip for the R6 Mark II, so you can put that on. It's the same grip that you can also get for the R6 and the R5. And with the grip, the camera lies especially nicely in your hand. When it comes to the batteries, the R6 has the same batteries as the R7 and the R5. And while the rear screen has the same resolution as the R7 and R8, the EVF actually got an upgrade and has a higher resolution of 3.69 million dots, which is definitely nice and makes the picture in your viewfinder just look a little bit less digital. When it comes to speed, the R6 Mark II is definitely amazing and one of the fastest, if not the fastest, Canon camera shooting up to 40 frames per second of full 14-bit RAW files in the electronic shutter mode and up to 12 frames per second in the mechanical and electronic first curtain shutter modes. So that's truly amazing and in combination with the great eye tracking autofocus it allows you to capture peak action scenes without missing any moments or any wing pose when you're photographing a bird in flight for instance. The only drawback again is the buffer because at the 40 frames per second the buffer is just 75 raw faults so that's just over one second of shooting and I think in this case again changing to zero will help you to get a larger buffer and not buffer out so quickly. When it comes to the autofocus and the R6 Mark II I'm definitely a believer and I think overall it's probably the best autofocus you can currently get in a Canon camera. Another area where the autofocusing system of the R6 Mark II really shines is in combination with the f11 600 and 800 mm lenses. It doesn't only give me better image quality with these lenses than any other Canon camera body, but it also gives me a much larger autofocusing areas with these lenses. Normally these lenses are quite limited to a square in the center of the frame, whereas on the R6 Mark II you almost get full coverage of the viewfinder, which is a fantastic improvement. 
For the video shooters among us, the R6 Mark II is also an amazing choice. It has much less overheating issues than the original R6 on R5, for instance, and it shoots up to 4K 60 downsampled from 6K, so you get great image quality, and then it can shoot full HD at up to 180 frames per second. So when it comes to video, it doesn't leave much to be desired, except that it doesn't shoot 4K at 120 frames per second. Only the R3 and the R5 can do that. But in terms of video, I think this camera is a fantastic choice and if I didn't have an R3, I would probably use an R6 Mark II to film most of my videos. What you will also like about the R6 Mark II is that it has the ability to do the pre-shooting, so you hopefully never miss that crucial moment again. Personally, I don't use it a lot because I find the implementation a little bit clumsy and whenever you fill up your buffer with the pre-shooting, it takes a little while before you can shoot again, so you kind of miss the next scene potentially. That's why I don't use it a lot personally, but it's definitely great to have that option in the camera. All in all, I basically love everything about the R6 Mark II. It's a fantastic camera with an amazing autofocusing system and great image quality. The only thing that stops me from purchasing one for myself is that I prefer having more megapixels than the 24 megapixels on a full frame sensor. That's basically the only thing that's holding me back. And the other reason is that I already have an R3 as well. If I didn't have an R3, I would have definitely bought an R6 Mark II and would have mainly used it to film myself. Before we talk about the R5, let's talk a little bit about the original R6. While it doesn't have all the features that the new R6 Mark II has, it's still a very capable camera. But there's definitely a few drawbacks. For instance, you only get 20 instead of 24 megapixels. You get a good autofocus instead of an amazing autofocus from the R6 Mark II. And especially for video, you get a lot more overheating with the original R6 that basically overheats in all video modes. Whereas if you're looking for a good capable video camera, I'd probably say an R8 or an R6 Mark II are better suited for you. The original R6 also doesn't have the ability to do the pre-shooting, for instance, but you can fit things like a battery grip, and all in all, it's definitely a very capable camera. So if you have the extra money and you can afford the R6 Mark II, I'd probably lean that way. But if you want to have a great deal on a great camera, the original R6 is definitely still a good deal as well, especially if you pick up a used body. The next camera body is the R5, and this is my go-to camera body. I have a few of these, and I've taken hundreds of thousands of images with these camera bodies, and they've delivered time after time in the field, and I've taken many amazing images with the cameras. While the R5 is far from perfect, it's probably the best compromise on the market for me at the moment. I get amazing image quality at 45 megapixels. I get really nice noise performance as well, even if I shoot at 16 or 20,000 eyes, all those files clean up very well. And I get beautiful video. And all of that comes with quite little downside. Most noticeable the issues I see in the field from time to time is the rolling shutter effect on image wobbles and overheating that happens when you're in warmer climates. In cooler climates, the R5 is definitely fine, but if I go to tropical Queensland, for instance, I often take an R3 for filming because it's not as prone to overheating as the R5. Even though the R5 is 45 megapixels, it still shoots in 20 frames per second in the electronic shutter mode. The only downside then is that it has only 12-bit RAW files available instead of full 14-bit RAW files. So you lose a little bit of image quality there, but I still find the images to be more than usable. In the mechanical shutter mode and the electronic first curtain shutter mode, the R5 can shoot at 12 frames per second. The buffer size in the R5 is definitely better than in some of these other cameras that we've talked about. And if you put it in zero mode, you can shoot well over 100 RAW files before you buffer out, and that should be enough in most situations. The R5 comes with an SD card and a CF Express Type B card slot. That means that the faster CF Express Type B card helps you to write quicker out of your buffer and so you can shoot faster again. So having these faster cards in the R5 is a definite advantage. The only downside with these CF Express Type B cards is that they cost more than the SD cards, but that extra price is definitely worth it because they're so much faster. When it comes to the bodies and the ergonomics, the R5 is quite similar to the original R6 and the R6 Mark II. There's a few buttons in different spots, and the R5, for instance, doesn't have a dedicated photo and video switch, so I assign that to the multifunction button at the front here, for instance. But other than that, it has the three wheels that are fantastic for shooting full manual mode, and of course, it has a joystick. So there's basically no complaints there, and using a camera in the field is very nice and easy. 
Speaking about nice and easy, the R5 also has a fantastic autofocusing system. It's not as advanced or accurate as the R3 or the R6 Mark II for instance, but it's more than capable, quite easy to use and tricks your subjects very well without jumping on and off all the time. And if you want to know how to set up your R5 the best way, make sure to check out my PDF setup guide down there in the description. The R5 has the same batteries as the R6 series and the R7 and also comes with a battery group available. If you need one, I would definitely recommend using one because you get much better battery life and it's much easier to shoot vertically as well. Compared to the R6 Mark II, the EVF on the R5 also is a bit of a bump up with 5.76 million dots, meaning that when you shoot them side by side, the picture in the R5 definitely looks a little bit more realistic and more refined rather than a little bit more digital and sort of pixelated in the R6 Mark II. If you're not shooting side by side, you probably never notice the differences, but it's nice to have the higher resolution for sure. So if you can stomach the price point of about $3,800, the R5 is definitely a fantastic camera for us photographers and offers us amazing image quality in the field and also the ability to crop because it has the 45 megapixel. And that's one of the main reasons I prefer it over the R6 Mark II, for instance. When it comes to video, the R5 is also no slouch. It's the only Canon camera currently that can shoot 8K up to 30 frames per second and 4K up to 120 frames per second. So these are fantastic video files you're getting out of these cameras and I've filmed many, many birds for many, many hours with these cameras and I'm very happy with the results. The only downside is that this camera tends to overheat from time to time, especially in warmer climates or if you're in a confined space like I'm in now at the moment. If I'm in these environments, I usually use my R3 for filming or would probably use an R6 Mark II going forward because the R5 is a little bit limited in these scenarios because it does tend to overheat. It's not as bad anymore as it was in the beginning, but from time to time an R5 in warmer climate will definitely overheat. So this is something you just be conscious of. And if you want this as your main video camera, you might have to find solutions like an external screen so it doesn't overheat as quickly. If I could only pick one camera body, I would currently probably pick an R5. The main reason being the great image quality with the 45 megapixels, 20 frames per second, and overall the camera simply has never really let me down. I've had so many great moments with it in the field delivering me some fantastic photos and videos. I've basically shot with all the camera bodies from all the big brands and I keep coming back to the R5 simply because it's so easy to use and gives me fantastic images. Let's talk about my favorite camera that I don't use all that much for photography, the Canon R3. If I had to pick one body shape and design and ergonomics, this would definitely be it. This camera just lies amazingly well in your hand. It's also the most weather sealed body from Canon. So in the rain, you should not have too many issues with this camera, whereas with an R6 Mark II or an R5, you might run into some issues. So an R3, when it comes to the body, is definitely standard. And I just love how it sits in your hand. And even though it's a bigger camera with a much bigger battery, it's actually not that much more heavy than some of these other cameras. So in that regard, Canon did extremely well and I truly love the camera for that. The R3 is equipped with a 24 megapixel stacked sensor this time around. So that means that it has very minimal rolling shutter and almost no image wobbles, which is a huge improvement compared to the R6 Mark II or the R5. Just like the R5, the R3 comes with one SD card slot and one SIF Express type B card slot, meaning that you can write those raw faults very quickly to the card. And this is probably the Canon camera where I have the least buffer issues because the buffer has a decent size and you have the fast cards and the smaller 24 megapixel file sizes. So hitting the buffer is a lot harder in the R3 than all the other Canon cameras. What's also great is that the R3 shoots full 14-bit RAW files across the whole range, meaning you can shoot 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter and get 14-bit RAW files, and you can shoot at 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter or the electronic first curtain shutter. Although on the R3 that really doesn't make sense because of the stacked sensor and the minimal rolling shutter, I only shoot with the electronic shutter on the R3 giving me fantastic results. In terms of the resolution of the EVF, it's similar to the R5, but the rear screen got another bump compared to the R5 now having 4.2 million dots. So it's very nice to look at the pictures on the rear screen and go, nice to go through the menu. So in terms of the EVF and the rear screen, the R3 is also standout and offers by far the best Canon has on offer at the moment. The main reason I love the R3 and why I use it so much is not photography as you might think, 
But video, it offers me 4K up to 120 frames per second. It can shoot 6K raw internally as well, which gives me beautiful footage that's really nice to edit, especially in high dynamic range situations. And the camera doesn't really overheat and with the much bigger battery, it also lasts much longer in the field. And most of my YouTube videos, for instance, are also filmed with the R3 because in my studio, R5s will overheat from time to time, whereas this R3 body will film just like a trooper without any issues. So in terms of video, the R3 is a true standout as well and it is my main video camera. You might ask, why is it not your main photo camera, even though it's amazing with an amazing autofocusing system, amazing image quality? And the reason is again, the 24 megapixels. I just feel a little bit too limited by constantly shooting with the 24 megapixel. You just have to be a few steps closer to your subject, which is not always possible. And just having the 45 megapixels from the R5 makes me come back to that over and over again. And I love the ability that I have in cropping a little bit more. So while I love the R3, and if I shoot a lot of action, I use it, but most of the time I tend to use the R3 for video and the R5 for photos. When it comes to the image stabilization, the R3 is also a true standout. It's by far the best IBIS and image stabilization combination that Canon has on the market. For instance, on the 100 to 500 millimeter lens, it basically doesn't move and you can easily take handheld video, for instance. So when it comes to the image stabilization, the R3 is by far the best camera in the Canon lineup as well. So if you want the best of the best and your budget allows to go for an R3, then you can basically not go wrong with this camera. You get great image quality, you get 30 frames per second, you have that stacked sensor with no rolling shutter, you get great video abilities, and you get this beautiful body design. So in that sense, the R3 is kind of a no-brainer, even though currently I would argue that for most people, the R6 Mark II might be a better pick because it's quite similar in what it can deliver. It might even have a slightly better autofocus and it costs a lot less than the R3. So if you're budget conscious, it feels like the R6 Mark II is almost a mini R3 currently. And now it's your time to let me know in the comments, what's your Canon body of choice currently? Are you happy with the ones you're using at the moment or are you looking at upgrading? Make sure to let me know. You might wonder why I haven't mentioned DSLR cameras in the video. And the main reason is that if I was recommending a new camera to someone now, I would not recommend going for a DSLR camera. The advantages of the mirrorless cameras are just so huge that I feel like you'd at a great disadvantage with a DSLR camera. Don't get me wrong, like a 7D Mark II or 5D Mark IV take great photos, but an R5 on R6 on R7 are just so much more advanced that you will be able to get more and better photos in the field with the mirrorless cameras. And even something like a 1DX Mark II or 1DX Mark III, in my opinion at least, lags quite a bit behind like an R3 or an R5. So personally, I wouldn't recommend going for DSLR cameras anymore unless you're very budget conscious. Then you can still get a great deal on a DSLR camera because there's a lot of on them on the market now from people updating to mirrorless cameras. But there's just so many drawbacks, for instance, like the frames per second are just so much slower. The image quality is not quite the same. And the biggest difference is the autofocus. With DSLR cameras, you just always have to move the autofocusing field around, try to keep it on the bird. You can't really sort of pre-compose your photos in the viewfinder as well. Whereas now with the eye tracking available in the modern mirrorless cameras, and Canon basically has it on all the mirrorless cameras now, is that it's so much easier to track the subject. Like action photography is much easier and it's so much easier to also compose your images in the viewfinder because you don't have to worry about where your autofocusing point is. The camera will actually just move it for you onto the subject and then keep it on the subject. So while I love shooting with DSLR cameras for many years and I've taken many thousands of images for like a 5D Mark IV for instance, it's not really something that I would recommend at this stage. And even a camera like a SAR 7 that is somewhat limited in certain areas, for me at least, would outperform a 5D Mark IV. Another interesting area is obviously new releases, namely like an R5 Mark II or an R1 that will probably be released sometime next year. And while I think that this shouldn't influence you too much currently, it's obviously something to keep in mind as well that potentially there will be a lot of R5s coming onto the market at a cheaper price when the R5 Mark II comes out, for instance. So you could either score a bargain or you might go and upgrade to an R5 Mark II at a later stage. What the R1 will look like, we really don't know at this stage and will also be an extremely expensive camera, probably similar shape to an R3, but with a much higher price point. So I think for most people, that's probably 
probably not the most attractive camera because of budget constraint. But I'm definitely excited to see what the future holds for Canon because the current cameras are already so amazing. So the next generation should be even better. What's your take on the new cameras? Are you waiting or holding out to upgrade because you think there's an R5 Mark II coming out, for instance? Or do you say it doesn't really matter? I live in the now and I need a good camera now. So what is the right camera for you? Ultimately, it will only be you who can decide that because you know your budget and you know what you want to photograph. For me personally, for instance, having a lot of megapixels, it's quite important because I photograph a lot of small birds that I can't always get close to. So having the ability to crop is definitely an advantage for me. So I'm naturally drawn towards an R7 or in my case, an R5. If you're more of an all-round shooter and you say I shoot a bit of landscapes, some people, some animals, some birds, then something like an R8 or an R6 Mark II could be a fantastic choice. But with the 24 megapixel full frame sensors, for someone like me, it can be challenging to get enough pixels on my subject at times. This is why I always say it really depends what you want to photograph with your camera because for some people 24 megapixels is more than enough and for others like me 24 megapixels is a little bit on the light side. When it comes to video, the only thing that really forces your hand is if you want to shoot 4K in 120 frames per second because currently only the R3 and the R5 offer that in the Canon lineup. The R6 Mark II, the R6 and the other bodies only offer 4K up to 60 frames per second and 120 or 180 frames per second in full HD. Ultimately, you can't really go wrong with any of these cameras. They all will deliver some amazing images for you, have fantastic eye tracking autofocus and great video capabilities. If you ask me, for most people, a camera like the R8, the R7 or the R6 Mark II is probably the sweet spot because you get amazing capabilities with not too many drawbacks at a great price point. And if you want to go that little bit higher, you can look at the R5 or maybe even the R3. So let me know, what's your choice? Do you agree with my findings or do you disagree? Let me know in the comments. Give me a thumbs up for this video. Make sure to check out my channel membership and hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video very soon. Bye guys.